Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Katiuska Polanco Guzman. Kati, as her friends and family call her, is many things an attorney, photographer, an artist, spiritual advisor, life coach, social media personality, and host of the podcast Between These Stitches, which is a podcast that talks to everyday artists about what makes fiber arts like knitting, crocheting, and weaving so special to them, as well as their unique contributions to the fiber arts community. Kati, it is awesome to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Mark. I'm really excited. <laughs> as am I, as am I. As of, the, the reason why I wanted to have you on is as of this recording, many people have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and it's causing them to perhaps rethink their priorities and even what they do for their livelihood. I'm hoping as a master of reinvention yourself that you can help our audience to develop the clarity and the courage to, to do some authentic self-reflection and, you know, and, and reinvent themselves if they feel called to do that. Yeah. But before we get into sort of that, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about your backstory. You have a fascinating backstory that others would want to hear about. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So before college, I, I think I have to say, you know, you mentioned like spiritual advisor and, and all these things. So just in general, there are certain things I've always done from a very young age. Um, so I've been an avid reader. Um, I've been into self-help for a very long time, which now, you know, the industry is moving to call it self-development. Um, and I've been into creative arts since I was a teenager. So all of those things really started when I was like 13, 14. Um, you know, I was scrapbooking. I was taking lots of pictures of my brother, uh, my youngest brother. I was crocheting at an early age, mm -hmm. exercising, again, reading self-help books and lots of just different types of books in general. Um, and then I got to college. <laughs> <laughs> and in college, there was... Um, and maybe even like in high school, you know, there's that push to get people to do things a certain way, right? You, you want to be a, a member of society and you, to a certain extent, we all want to people please somehow um, and think that if we follow certain rules, then we will all be better members of society and um, be able to accomplish our goals. Right. So I think listening to that in high school, um, despite, let's say, many of my interests, and then getting to college and having people sort of guide you or even sometimes maybe push you in certain directions that you might not have thought about or even considered, you begin to sort of create like this path for yourself, um, intentional, sometimes unintentional, right? Like subconscious. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You're just kind of going along. And, um, and you kind of do things based on what you've known or learned without sometimes really considering what you want to really do. So I say that because in college, I went in as a business major. Um, even though in high school, I was really interested in design and architecture, art related things, um, because I took a lot of those kinds of classes in high school and really, really enjoyed them. Um, unfortunately, my high school counselor was not very big on pushing me to in that direction. She was more on pushing me into um, a community college, didn't think I would go very far kind of thing. Um, but, but luckily for me, I already had um, a certain mindset, right? Yeah. It was like, I'm gonna do this. And again, remember I already, as a teenager early on, I was like, there are certain things I wanna do, I'm not gonna stay stuck. Um, so with the encouragement of my sister, of course, she was like, no, you just can't go to a community college, make sure you're applying to Rutgers. Um, and at the time, Rutgers had multiple schools merged into one big one, but um, I applied to like three or four of these colleges and was accepted to all of them and forever grateful. Thank you, Rutgers. <laughs> mm. so, um, so I ended up going to Rutgers College and I went in as a business major thinking, because um, my family was pushing me in that direction, you've got to do business, you've got to do this type of stuff. Yeah. 
and practically failed out of my first semester because <laughs> the courses just, you know, weren't what I felt I could do or handle and, you know, and, and really, you know, freshman year is really hard to get into some of those classes that just don't make any sense to you and just dive right in. And so there wasn't a lot of guidance for me in terms of what to do. Luckily for me at Rutgers, there was um, a nice group of like counselors that I found and were really great in helping guide me in a direction um, by posing lots of questions, right? You know, is this serving you? Is, is, is this class working for you? Is that something you're really interested in? Does that really appeal to you? You know, like, you know, all those kind of questions to really begin to open up the mind in terms of, you know, what can you do that is going right. to make you happy kind of thing. Right. So I switched gears from business and ended up majoring in, you know, liberal arts and forever grateful for that. Ended up, um, writing a, a thesis on you know cultural identity and what that means and and just that type of work itself really kind of i felt fell in line with a lot of the stuff i had already been reading as a teenager until mm -hmm. in terms of self-development and i found it really enlightening and then when i graduated college um i decided to go to law school um mm -hmm. and part of that is i've always wanted to help people um yeah. and help give people a voice to you know their concerns what they were feeling um and i knew i grew up in um like my family and seeing certain things that i just felt were always wrong yeah. um and i felt like law was a good direction to sort of take that you know how can i help people and sort of uh right the wrongs right that they're experiencing or give people the ability to speak up again for what is going on in their lives so then i went to law school i worked full time um, at the time that I started, I had a one-year-old, mm -hmm. so I worked full-time. I went to school part-time. Um, I did law school four years at night for four years straight. <laughs> it was it was very interesting times, but I'm grateful to have gotten through it. I had a lot of help, of course. You know, it does take a village um, sure. to raise a family, so I did have a lot of support. And um, I was grateful that I did it. I ended up then, you know, practicing as an attorney for over 10 years. Um, and it was great work. I worked in the nonprofit sector because that's really where my heart was. Mm -hmm. um, and I did work just helping people with, you know, sort of everyday issues that come up, especially in the work that I was doing. We mostly help people who could not afford to hire attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we did a lot of low income families, but I felt that that's, you know, where there was a need. And so that's where I focused. So early on in your career, you were a, you were an attorney. Um, and, and, but at some point you made the switch, you know, you, you, you said, I'm, I'm meant for something different, right? What made you, what made, what, what made you really rethink? I mean, because going from going from law to to the life of an artist, essentially, um, and and, and you know, that that's a pretty that's a pretty big leap. You know, what what was the thing that really sparked that reinvention? So I think there were a few things going on. So towards the end of the time where I was practicing, um, I started feeling anxiety about the work. Mm -hmm. um, and I no, no longer felt connected to it. So I felt um, I was doing the things just to do them. There wasn't the sort of joy that it brought early on. Um, and maybe to a certain extent, it was probably monotonous and I could have maybe pivoted within the legal field. But I also felt I just didn't want to be in the legal field anymore. As much as um, the work that I did was very important, the legal field itself has a lot of constraints. Um, mm. You know, there's certain levels of decorum and right. um, rules and regulations. It is law, right? <laughs> sure, sure. So um, I felt like those things were very constraining. And many times, actually, um, I remember a few judges in the uh, what's called the Office of Administrative Law. So those cases are not like in a superior court, like regular court, as people think about it. It's sort of at, at an administrative level to help um, individuals with specific 
types of cases, usually public service benefits, right? Mm -hmm. um, public benefits. So every time I would go in there, they would be like, you know, Miss Polanco, because that was before I was married. Um, you know, you have such creative legal arguments and we would love to be able to apply them, but within the constraints of the law, we're unable to, right? Mm. Um, and because sometimes I felt what my, my clients needed was beyond what could be provided by these services. Um, and because of the law related to those services, things were really limited. Um, so anyway, I, that's, I think that's part of what happened. I started feeling in, um, that I was really constrained by it. And then at some point, um, the leadership in New Jersey changed. So our, the funding for the organization that I worked for was partly uh, given to us by the state. Mm. So I ended up being uh, laid off and I felt like that was a good time to really pivot uh, since the funding for uh, that types of services went down and many of us who were working at the time ended up being laid off. I took that opportunity and said, you know what, this is my time. This, and many people saw it as, oh my God, you know, the world's ending. I just got laid off. And I was like, you know what, this is probably a blessing. So I took the opportunity. And from there, I definitely ended up pivoting and saying, if I'm going to do anything, now's the time. So that's when I started working as a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so it, it's a really interesting journey you took. And, you know, you, you, you followed you followed a path where you thought you were going to be helping people and you did for, you know, for a certain time, but you couldn't, you couldn't help them in the way that you wanted to because of the constraints of the environment or the law. You know, the very thing that you studied is the very thing that was constraining people in, in your, and, and constraining your ability to help them. So, you know, along comes circumstance, you know, like what you just, what you described was several years ago, but many people right now are experiencing the same thing. Yes. You know, 20, there's probably north of 20 million people still out of work right now who are thinking about, you know, what do I do now? Do I try to get back into what I was doing before? Or mm -hmm. do I, or, or do I, you know, reinvent myself, you know, and, and, um, I had a very similar, I had a very similar story. I mean, actually just, just recently myself. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and it, it caused me to really think about, you know, what do I want, what do I want to do? You know, and I, I think, you, I think you're absolutely right in that it's a, it's a gift that, mm -hmm. that, that, that you were given. Um, what do you think, aside from circumstances mm -hmm. like this, what do you think causes people to want to reinvent themselves? So I think usually it's desire. Um, mm -hmm. There's usually a deep desire to do something. Uh, sometimes it's a desire that was born many years ago and right. just no one ever really had the faith. And I think this goes a little bit back to your original question. I feel like maybe I didn't answer it, but I think I needed to have faith in myself. Um, in the process and then really taking the time to think about you know what do i want for myself as a person mm. and how do i want to show up in the world yeah so i just knew that by the time i was laid off as an attorney that that role or story that i created about what it meant to be an attorney was just no longer serving me yeah uh, so it, it was it was time to sort of create a new story and so I had to do the work and say to myself, what is this new story? What am I trying to say? Um, and I, I think that requires people, and I know this pandemic right now has allowed people maybe the time to really sit and think, but it really takes a lot of sitting, thinking, writing about it. Um, I mean, I guess it's a personality thing, figuring out how do you best make decisions um, and then having faith and trust that it will work out. Because I think um, one of the things I learned is that when people push you and society has these specific ideas of what you should be doing or how you should be you know, living your life, um, you tend to work on sort of a, like an automatic pilot. Um, and mm -hmm. you kind of do the things just for the sake of doing them. Uh, but 
and looking back, if I would have just been, if I would have just done that, I, I don't know that I would be happy right at this moment um, in time. I mean, the pandemic has hit us all, in, you know, in different ways. For me, it's been a more of a, like an emotional roller coaster <laughs> in yeah. terms of no school, school, you know, right, and and all of the other, you know, circumstances going on in America right now. Yeah. Um, but not in terms of who I am as a person, like none of those things for me were challenged. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because I already went through that, right? I already took a hard look at who am I, who do I want to be, and how do I get to where I want to go? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that's always impressed me about you is, is your level of authenticity and, and your ability to stay true to yourself despite what other people say. And you, I mean, you take in input, but but you you are your you are definitely your own person. You make your own decisions, and you you sort of march to your own drum, and that's admirable. Um, what what does how important is authenticity in in this whole process in this whole in the whole process of reinvention? Um, it's definitely let's say it's it's tantamount right it's it's so important because if you cannot be authentic um with yourself really at the end of the day i think then you're going to be unable to really go out there and try to do the things that you want to do to sort of let's say reinvent yourself and become a new person yeah. it's very easy i think to get caught up in you know what other people will think and and what they will say but right when you are authentic and to me authentic authentic means um, really taking into consideration all the parts of who you are, you mm -hmm. know, the mm -hmm. contradictions, the good, the bad, and, and what that all means for yourself alone, right? Not yeah. with anyone else's opinion. Um, and then knowing those things and then just going out into the world and just doing it, right? Doing what you need to do, showing up, being who you are, saying the things you need to say, um, and just being in your own like skin and body, right? As, right. as you need to be so that you can right. just live your life in, in a good way that's good for you, right? Right, right. Do you think it's possible to live a happy life even if someone has to make compromises in order to uh, accomplish it? Absolutely. Or, or is authenticity an all or nothing proposition? Um, I don't think it is. I mean, right. We don't live in the world alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's true. Right? We have to make compromises, right? I think part of being authentic too is one is expressing yourself. It's, it's mm -hmm. just saying, um, you know, these are my needs. These are the things that I want because you understand who you are and what your values are um, so that you can express them. And then compromising really requires working in the world with other people. So if you can come into the world and say, I am this way, and these are the things that I truly need, um, mm -hmm. and then someone else can do the same, right? Then there, it's much, so much easier to come together and do the things that you need to do together, right? And I think, I think of that in terms of like even my own marriage. I think we work really well because we're both honest, right? We're straightforward. Right say what we mean we mean what we say <laughs> right right and and we're willing to talk about it right and so we're gonna look at the pros we're gonna look at the cons we're gonna talk about what that means and then we and we really end up making compromises all the time i mean you know any relationship at the end of the day needs compromise but when you come to the relationship as a whole person um expressing all of who you are you know your authenticity um, you know your values, then it's so much easier to sort of be open and connect with people and compromise. Yeah. What kind of personal work do you do on yourself on, on a regular basis? So I do several things. Um, one, I've been like a lifelong journaler. So I have been journaling since I was a teenager, back wow. to, you know, self-development. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, I've also exercised since I was a teenager. Um, so eat and eating healthy um, came into play as well as meditating. So I've been meditating more in the last like 
five to 10 years on and off, but more so definitely the last five more consistently. Um, and I think all of those things are sort of help me be grounded. So I like to really think things through, process information before I d make decisions. So yeah, so that, that's, that's most of the work that I do. Um, I'm an introvert, so mm -hmm. talking stuff out doesn't always work for me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> How can a person become more self-reflective and self-aware? I mean, I would say journaling first. Mm -hmm. When you're able to put um, your thoughts on paper and then read them back, then you can yeah. really see some of the thoughts that you had. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. oh, wow, was I really thinking that? Do I really believe that? Right. Um, think question things more easily, right? <laughs> um, right. And, and just listening to yourself, right? When you're talking to others or taking note of actions you take, um, you know, if you're gossiping with other people about, you know, mm -hmm. what's she doing or what's she wearing or what's he saying or how did he act or things like that. Those are things to sort of look out for um, yeah. and think to yourself, why am I doing that? I think being self-reflective really means taking a look at yourself and saying, you know, why did I do that? Um, mm -hmm. Is that really serving me? Is that in my highest good? Um, mm -hmm. Is that serving others kind of thing? Um, so. That's brilliant. All right. So one of the areas that has been an interest of, of mine uh, is this area of confidence. Mm -hmm. And I've asked a variety of guests their take on confidence, and I'm curious to know, from your perspective, how does a person develop confidence, and what do you think gets in their way? I want to say action is the first thing that comes to mind for me in terms of confidence. You have to, I think, actively seek it or do it. Yeah. Um, so if, you know, I, I've realized a lot of times that sometimes um, fears and other things come up partly because we haven't actually taken a step forward in the direction of something. Mm -hmm. So unless you actually, I feel like take the step forward, you're not going to feel confident about it. Um, right. So I, I, for me, it feels like action, some type of movement, um, not staying in your head uh, helps yeah. a lot. Yeah. And what gets in the way of confidence? I think other people's opinion. Hmm. Yeah, other people's yeah. opinion. Mostly, and sometimes our own perceived ideas of other people's opinion. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. Sometimes we, we think someone thinks a certain way or is going to say something, and it's not really the case. You know, they could have been thinking the complete opposite, but our perception or what we think they're going to say is really will get us in the way and sort of sometimes stop us in our tracks. Um, but so then that would lead me to think that confidence is um, a mental construct, right? That we mm -hmm. have to um, work on, on a regular basis. Yeah. Tell me about fiber art and how you got into it and how you developed, how you even, you know, went and, and, started producing a podcast around it. Tell me about that. So I started crocheting when I was 16. Um, and I've been crocheting ever since. It's gotten me through the tough times. <laughs> yeah. Made lots of gifts, sold lots of things, um, handmade. I, actually, I'm making a blanket right now. To, that's uh, in order. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so I got into the crocheting just as like, I saw someone doing it and I was like, well, this is really interesting. It wasn't something I had seen. And then I just started doing it pretty much self-taught. You know, when I started, there were no YouTubes or videos out there. Right, right. <laughs> so I just bought the materials, went to the local craft store and just, you know, little by little started buying yarn, started doing it. Um, it was a real stress reliever in, in law school. Um, and then I would, 
as I was even practicing, you know, sell items to people who would ask and, and just make them as gifts. And then now as I've been home and, you know, doing photography and stuff, I've photographed uh, artists, um, photographed uh, various, like just items that people have made for them. Um, so I, you know, I sort of bring those two things together, photography and uh, fiber arts, put them together. Yeah. And the, the podcast started because um, I went to an in-person event uh, a couple of years ago and in the fiber arts world, just like any industry, right? There are big name artists and everyone comes out to see them. You know, that's kind of why you go to these events and right. <laughs> you know, knitters, crocheters, weavers, you name it, right? There's yeah. big name artists. <laughs> and um, there were many people there that I ended up meeting that I was like, wow, they have such interesting stories, right? They, yeah. you know, why did they start knitting or why did they start crocheting or how did they get into weaving and, or hand dyeing yarn and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, wow, these, these stories are really interesting. Around the same time that that happened, the uh, fiber arts community online, I'll say on Instagram and Facebook and other places, was having a similar uh, reaction to what happened to this country in May in terms of and uh, realizing that there wasn't enough diversity, inclusivity, there was a lot of racism hmm. going on in the fiber arts community. Wow. Um, sex, ageism, like everything, you know, like, and even like a sort of like a high class mentality of like, well, you can't buy cheap yarn, you have to knit with expensive yarn, you know, and it's like, yarn is yarn, right? It, it was this interesting explosion of, uh, and dynamics of, you know, why are we limiting our community to yeah. certain types of people, yarn and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? But yes, even that type of industry, you know, has its sort of ups and downs. So uh, mostly on Instagram is where I, I, you know, interacted with people and yeah. I just found it so interesting that, you know, I'm like, you know, this is, I always wanted to do a podcast. I always enjoyed listening to them yeah. because I can make and listen at the same time. Sure, sure. And so, um, I was like, you know what, these artists that I spoke to, that I met, these are the people I think we really get need to know in order to make the fiber arts community more inclusive, more diverse, mm -hmm. um, and understand that, you know, we all come from different walks of life. And we all make a contribution. So that's how the podcast got started. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. What an amazing story. Because, and, and what an interesting microcosm of what's going on in society today, yes. right? You know, when you look at the macro and you see all of the, you know, upheaval, you know, and, I, and I'm not using that negatively, but when you look at something like fiber arts, right, which you would think, is such i mean like it, it, it's it's universal i mean it's, it's the it's the making of things right you know use it using fi all sorts of fiber like it you would think that it's inclusive but to see that even in the fiber community which in in my humble opinion probably doesn't get a lot of press right it, to see that you know that same sort of upheaval happening is 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 absolutely fascinating right so it doesn't really matter where you are in society you could be in the fiber community and still be experiencing a lot of this sort of the societal um exclusions and and, and things like that 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 other people are experiencing in other parts of the you know the world so it's very interesting yeah yeah i mean it was, it was to the point where some, many artists came out and said, you know, I walked into a yarn store and I wasn't welcome. Or, you know, really? a black woman saying, yeah. Or a black woman saying, you know, uh, being told by a white woman, um, oh, you knit too, as if in black people don't knit. And, you know, all sorts of unfortunate, you know, dialogues and conversations about ways that people don't realize. And I, I find that so interesting, right? Because coming from the Dominican Republic, no. our, everyone crochets in the Caribbean, right? And, and 
<laughs> it's just like you, know, you walk in, there are doilies everywhere, and sure. you know everything is covered with like granny blankets and, and all sorts of stuff. And for for lot, you know, people to think that it only that this the world sort of exists like this, and only these type of people do this is was just it was mind blowing to me as a person um, because I was like. I learned from a Puerto Rican woman how to crochet, right? I didn't know, I didn't think it was exclusive to just Puerto Rican women, right? But, mm -hmm. and I already knew that it existed in the Dominican Republic because having traveled there, having seen people do it, like it was just, it was wild in terms of seeing how, you know, others sort of approached it and, and thought that it was sort of like their own microcosm of what, knitting or crocheting really meant but it's worldwide right it, it didn't start yesterday um, <laughs> no, yeah. and people have been weaving for centuries right like weaving just didn't show up in the united states like you know a hundred years ago right there was people right. in you know the middle east weaving right there was people right. here in, in south america weaving it's just it's it was interesting um yeah to see how that the small world of knitting and the fiber arts community is really a reflection of the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's amazing. Yeah. I want to take a step back a little bit uh, and ask you a few more general questions about, about you and, and just your take on some things. What is, I consider you a very, a very successful person. What is one secret of your success that you would share with others? Oh, um, I think I would say being self-motivated. Hmm. Um, I was talking to my daughter the other day and I was like, uh, I was like, oh, I'm not really as self-motivated as I used to be. And she was like, what? You're the most self-motivated person I know. <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I don't know that, right. but it's, I'm saying in terms of being self-motivated, she's right. I am very self-motivated. Um, I think part of that is that desire that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you have to know uh, sort of what you want, where you want to go. And that to me is a big uh, propelling force in terms of going and doing the things that I end up doing, right? So right. self-motivation is a lot of it. Yeah. What do you want most for your life? Um, right now, I think it's joy. Mm. Yeah. I don't know that we, I think given the current circumstances, always feel that joy. But yeah. um, I've, I've learned through not practicing and, and uh, as an attorney in the last 10 years and all that is that life is really lived in sort of um, what I call the mundane, right? The everyday mm -hmm. stuff. And that's really where the joy is. Um, yeah. you know, we can seek and, you know, the big things, the big accomplishments and, and all that. But right. when you look at sort of the everyday and you see, um, you know, your child smiling, uh, hugging your husband or yeah. spending time with family, having a good meal, you know, or drinking my coffee on the patio. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> or whatever it is. So those are the little things that bring joy. And when you can sort of look at all those and add them up, then I think you have a good life. Yeah. If you could give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? The same thing I tell my eldest and that I'm now telling the younger children, live free. <laughs> and when I say that, I mean mostly, um, live free of the constraints of your mind. Um, I think that was one that I had to learn, um, you know, going back to really making, pivoting in life, making different choices, um, and then not being stuck in what someone else has told you is the way life should be. So when you can really do that, then I think you're free. Yeah, that's, no, that's, that's amazing advice. How do you want to leave the world better than you found it? Oh my gosh, it's so big, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think just doing what I can, I think for my loved ones um, and letting them know I love them, that I care for them and that um, if they can go out and love themselves, right? And be free. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've done my job. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you feel people need to know from, from you, your knowledge, your experience? Um, maybe just in terms of if, if people want to pivot and reinvent themselves, uh, to just really trust, mm -hmm. to, and, and trust themselves, right? Trust that you know what's best for you and your family, despite the feelings of fear that can come up um, and despite the idea that life has to look a certain way. Yeah. I think everything I've told you sort of correlates. I feel like it's one big circle, right? You, you have to do the self-reflection. You have to be willing to, to take the step forward and you have to have faith and trust in yourself as an individual um, to be able to, to do anything, you know? So yeah, have faith. You can do it. <laughs> if not, call. That, that's, that's, ama that's amazing advice. Thank you. Thank you. Where can people find you online? So online, I am at uh, Between These Stitches. Uh, that's my website. That is my Instagram handle. Um, I do have a photography website, which is separate. And that is my name, Katiuska Guzman. Um, I haven't updated it, so don't look at it. But <laughs> I've been mostly very active right now in the fiber arts community, um, making and just, you know, being involved there. So, yeah. um, and that's really where my heart is, where the joy is. Um, so yeah, that's where I am. <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much for being with me on the podcast today. You've shared incredible insights and, 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 you know, your, your advice, your spirit, you know, I, I think that if people take the time to listen to this, they're really going to walk away better. So thank you very, very much for, for taking time away from your family uh, to spend with me and with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it.